Hi friends, Tracy here from The Sewing Channel. Welcome to the 1970s. I never pass up a chance to go to my Goodwill in the book aisle. That's where I found this gem right here. Every now and again, I come across a quilt that I just have to make. Since I grew up in the 1970s, I couldn't wait to make this quilt. Watch the video so you can learn how you can get your hands on a free template for this quilt. Enough talking already. Let's dive right in to the 1970s. I definitely would love to give credit to the person who designed the quilt in the book that I'm making today, but unfortunately, as far as the designers go, they totally left out the page 78 and 79. It's nowhere to be seen here, as you can see. But if I look down further under acknowledgements, I do see the page 78 and 79 was acknowledgement to the Rainbow Shop, Beverly Hills, California. This is all I have as far as designer acknowledgement for this quilt that is in my book today. Let's talk about the colors that are in the original quilt. You can see here, there are a lot of primary colors. You have your navy, but you also have some electric blue in here. And you also have some very light colored blues, almost like a sky blue. And I represent that here. And the electric blues, I found a few different colors that did match that. You also have this blue fabric here that has some darker blues in it with some white flowers and just some different things that are within that print. I did find a couple blue prints that I did use. They weren't spot on like in the book, but they were close enough. The red is just a very true red. It's a very cool red. I did find a couple different gingham checks to represent that are in the initial quilt. They did seem to go with more solids, but there are some dots in there you can see, and some have tiny flowers. You have your greens here, evergreen, your forest green, your green green, your true green. <laughs> but they did incorporate some plaid greens in here, and I was able to find some plaids that actually matched pretty darn well, and I was excited about that. Now the yellows, or the yellow oranges, I'm going to say, they were the hardest in this entire quilt to find. That's why I only have a few represented here that I actually used. It was not a bright yellow. It was more of an orangey yellow. I did try initially to do some yellows that were close to this, I thought, and it did not look right in this quilt because it's that overall orangey yellow feel. I did find that in a couple of Lori Holt fabrics I found in orangey yellow. This one worked really well. And a couple more solids that I did find that were more orangey yellow. This one I did not use. It was more of a pale yellow. So that one was out. So out of all the colors, that one was the hardest to find. Something you need to know about this particular quilt here that's in the book. They back then suggested that you use different textures like velours and flannels and, and different things like that, different fabrics. Well, I didn't want my quilt to be like that. I wanted my 1970s quilt to have all quilting cotton. Because quilting cotton is very predictable, that's what I went with. Now, if you choose to make this, certainly you could do the velour here. Some of this red is almost like a plasticky looking red, so I'm not sure what that one is made of at all. I don't know. But they did suggest using different ones. So I took some of my fabrics that were at home here, cut them into tiny pieces, sewed them all together in a row, and I took this to the store to make sure that I had the right hue or tone of color. Because this is a certain vibe, so to speak, that's exactly what I wanted was this vibe. So these were the colors that I ended up taking. This is a good tip just to take to the store with you so you can actually see because you don't wanna you know, waste a lot of money on fabric that isn't going to go in this particular project. So I do feel like this has that vibe that's in this quilt. Let's talk about thread for a second and how I applicate this onto the quilt. In the book, they said that they used a satin stitch and it just, 
is a zigzag that's really close together and they stitched around every single petal and every single center as well. If I did it the way they do it in the book, it would make an extremely stiff and uncomfortable quilt to lay with. So right away I knew I wasn't gonna do that. I decided on raw edge applique and once this washes, this will all fray up and it'll be extra, extra soft. Now I did keep in the same theme of the navy blue thread that they used. And you can see here that I used navy blue as well to outline all of my petals and my center. I've told you before in the past that my family will not lay with a quilt that's stiff. So that's why I chose also not to use any applique type fusible on the back of each of these petals. I used absolutely nothing. I wanted total fluidity within this quilt. The only thing I did use was some 505 spray adhesive to stick these to the quilt as I was designing all of the flowers on it. The thread I used in this quilt was a Coats covered cotton. This was new to me. I'd never used anything like it. I'm used to my So Fine by Superior, but I didn't have any in navy. So I went with this, what I found at the store. Do I like this? Eh. It's okay. Would I have rather had my superior so fine navy thread to do this in? Absolutely. In a pinch, this was fine. And I say in a pinch, I mean so excited that I can't contain myself to even wait a couple days for a mail order to come. So you yeah. can see here in this picture that this quilt was bound with a red colored fabric. I had thought about going back to the store and trying to find something that was very similar to that, but in the end, I decided on some minky dot. I know my family loves minky, so it was really a no-brainer. I used the minky backing itself to self-bind to the front of this quilt, and we'll go into much more of that here in a bit. Every color that's represented in this picture, they had that exact minky color at the store. But as you can imagine, this orangey-yellow minky dot, there was a ton left on the bulk and it was on sale, so I snatched it up. I thought it would go perfectly with our 1970s quilt. The most efficient way that I found to make a bunch of flowers all at one time was to layer about seven pieces of fabric together, take one of the templates, trace it onto one of the backs of those fabrics, then stay stitch on the outer side of where you just marked, then cut just on the inside of that stitch mark. Stay stitching these all together first will definitely help with any slippage when you cut. You need to mix and match all of your centers with all of your flowers in the right sizes. After they're all matched, grab your invisible glue stick, mark the backs with the glue stick, press them onto the flower, and then give it a hot press just to help it dry. Layer some muslin over top of a piece of batting in the size that you prefer for your quilt. I spray basted mine together and hung them from my design wall. Doing your prep work is half the battle. Check out all of my 1970s flowers just sitting on my table, piles of them, ready to go into my quilt. This was so much fun. In the book it said to start in the top left hand corner and then overlap with your flowers all the way down like cascading from left to bottom and left to right I guess. I did make a few mistakes in that sequence. I have some overlapping when they shouldn't have but I don't think you can tell. Right before I put each flower up onto my design wall I did spray the back of it with some 505 and then layered it on top of that and then I speckled in some small flowers, large flowers, medium flowers. You need all those different shapes in order to fill in all of those different spaces. Like right here on the side, I cut some flowers in half with no round circles in them and sort of put them off to the side toward the binding area. It just helped to fill in everything. I got really excited when I started to see everything come together on my design board. You can see here that that smaller flower definitely filled that tiny area in perfectly. Next, it was time to tack all of the centers of the flowers only down. 
I thought that that would help me at least tack those down first before I tackled all of the petals of the flowers. If I had it to do all over again, I would do the top, then the middle, and then the bottom as far as sewing the middles down and attaching the petals goes. So I decided to tack the middles down after it was three quarters of the way filled in. So it was kind of hard to keep track of what flower needed to be tucked under what flower. And that's where I kind of got things mixed up. I want you to take note that right here, I did leave all of the sides open. I wasn't sure if I was going to add the extra fabric on top to camouflage or if I was going to tuck it underneath and camouflage. Here's a better shot of that side of the quilt where I didn't stitch those flowers down. This is a shot of the quilt about three quarters of the way all stitched down with the flowers. Here I'm just showing you an example of an area that would take a small flower, the one with the four petals. It fits in a cross plus shape almost and it fits that area just perfectly. That is the whole reasoning, I believe, why they had three different sizes with all different petals on the flowers. Since I was doing raw edge applique, I sort of knew that this was going to happen. You see that white area? It didn't get quite covered, so this is my easy fix for that. I just found some scrap fabric that was in the same color range that was right next to where the opening was and pinned it down so that way I knew when I got to the sewing machine that that's where I needed to stitch. Here I'm just showing you some real live action of me <laughs> spray basting those flowers and then sticking them where I thought they went best up on the quilt. I rarely work with primary colors in quilting so it was a nice change to finally get to work with some really bright vibrant colors. Here's another example of how that little four petal flower fits nicely right there. Once I had all of my flowers down, then it was time to square up this quilt to see how much more I needed to add to the quilt. And believe it or not, I had many more petals to add to this quilt. I first squared up all four corners and then I went around and made everything nice and evenly square along all edges of the quilt. I fold my quilt in half to make sure that I'm squared up as good as it can be anyways. Now to fill in all those white spaces along all the edges of this quilt. So you can see like I took little pieces of scraps that I curved to make it look like a petal, put it on the side of the quilt, and then I would stitch it onto the quilt. That was a bit tedious for me. That was a lot of adding in there at the end. Once all the edge pieces were on, then it was time to stay stitch around the entire quilt. I chose to do that because it had a lot of bias edges everywhere on this quilt. I wish you could have seen my face and seen me jumping for joy when I put this up on my design wall after they were all on my quilt, even before I put the backing on. I was super excited. I kept looking at my quilt, I kept looking at the book, then my quilt, and I'm like, oh my word, these colors are spot on. Now on to the backing. So of course I had to piece my backing together because my minky only came in one size. So this is me laying everything out on my sewing room floor. I taped down the minky and I needed to see just how much more I needed on the side. So once I figured that out, I went ahead and cut what I needed. And then here's a shot of me sewing those two pieces of minky together. Here I'm showing you the wrong side of the minky just to show you where I had to splice everything together. I had to figure out how much I wanted my self binding to wrap around and I decided on an inch. So my tape is measured from the edge of the quilt to my needle one inch and that's where I needed to sew and you can see here I am using my walking foot and definitely I recommend a walking foot otherwise you're going to end up with crazy stitches. It's important to note the way I did my binding was to stitch all four sides leaving all four corners open. Before I mitered the corners together I took a sharp tiny pair of scissors and trimmed all along the edge where that minky dot was. And it cleans up beautiful, this minky, if you ever get a chance to work with it. 
it really isn't that hard to work with. It's actually quite easy and it trims up beautiful with no fraying and no pieces of fuzz everywhere. You don't even have to tuck it in or under anything and then so you just trim it. It never frays. Here's one of the corners and all I do is just lift that minky down like just toward the center that point and I even lay my scissors there because that tells me where the point is and I kind of fold in both sides just to see that it's gonna work I mean it's quite crude really <laughs> and then I just cut the tip off I mean I do have a nice neater way to do this and I don't know why I chose to do this one this way but I did so here once that tip is cut you're just going to fold in both sides like so pop a clip on it so it doesn't move anywhere <laughs> take it back to your sewing machine and line it up along with that one inch mark that we made with the tape sew up the sides meeting in the corner and then also sew two lines down from the point of the corner toward the center then trim off all of the excess minky I really do love the way this wraps around and gives it that nice finished look from the front. This is how I tack down my minky to the rest of my quilt. I first pin a spot on the back. Then I lift over the quilt to the front. I find that pin where I just pinned and then I pop a pin in from the front. Then I will flip it back over and pull that initial pin that I first put in out. That way I can see when I get to the sewing machine exactly where I need to stitch my layers together. So here I'm at the sewing machine and I'm just gonna go back and forth a few times at about a quarter to a half an inch. I will do this all over the quilt to ensure that I have no saggy spots on the back of my quilt. Here's a shot of everything all stitched together and here's where I had to miter those fabrics together. It's kind of a bummer, but it's okay. Here's a shot of this lovely quilt right before I washed it and dried it. Do you see 1970s in this quilt? I was halfway through my 1970s quilt when I realized, hey, some of these reds and these dark colors, they might just bleed. Oh my word, it's too late now. I bought some Shout Color Catchers. I'm going to now put this quilt in the washer and the dryer with those shout color catchers. And I'm going to say a prayer too, because, oh my word, if this bleeds on this quilt, I'm going to be so upset. <laughs> the quilt is looking great. It just finished its washing cycle in cold water and the catchers are looking pretty good. I hope it survives the dryer. So here are my color catchers after they came out of the dryer. Yes, I put them in the washer and the dryer. <laughs> I wanted to make sure I was gonna catch it all. You can see here that I have a little bit of some red right here on the corner of this sheet, but nothing significant at all. I'm going to take a fresh one out of the box so you can see the difference in color. So you can see there it is whiter than the rest and the other ones look maybe a bit dingy but that's about all i am really impressed do you know that most of my quilting cotton came from joanne fabrics and walmart whoever tells you that their reds bleed they don't not for me they didn't or maybe it was that prayer that i said right before i threw it in the washer what a relief it's out of the dryer and it is looking pristine. The color catchers came out totally clean. None of my colors seem to have faded, not one bit. You can see here the fraying that happens with this type of raw edge quilting. As I continue to wash this quilt, this will only get softer and softer over time. The frays will keep coming, but they'll never go as far as the line where I stitched. I can tell already it's super soft. I love my 1970s flower power quilt. I almost forgot. Do you want a free template for all three flowers to make this quilt? It's important to note that these three flowers that I'm giving you for free, they are my design. They did not come from this book. The book does give basic measurements of a basic flower, 
but it doesn't give you what I've given you here. They're not even the same sizes, they're different. And you can have these for free. There's a link down in my description box just below this video. I'll even make it easier for you. I will pin the link at the top of the comment section. If you download my three flower patterns, do me a favor and share this video on one of your social media platforms. It can be anywhere, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, any of them, I don't even know. And if you don't have social media platform, then you can just share it with a friend. Do you want more of the sewing channel? Click one of the links around me right now and I'll see you in the next tutorial. Until next time on the sewing channel, take care.